All right, it looks like we are live on Facebook and YouTube, so I think uh, we're going to go ahead and get started for this week's uh, Museums from Your Home live stream. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today are Brandon Thompson, Director of the Gorgas House Museum and Catherine Edge, Director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum. And I also see that we have a guest with us today. Brandon, would you like to introduce him? Yes, I would. Uh, we are joined once again uh, by Dr. John Beeler, a uh, professor at the University of Alabama's Department of History, uh, whose research interests include you know, the social and cultural history of Victorian Britain, public opinion and defense policy, imperial defense administration, the libertarian fallacies, uh, lots and lots of research interests. Um, uh, Dr. Beer so graciously agreed to join us once more. And because this is our last uh, last one of these, at least for the time being, uh, we couldn't think of a better guest to help us uh, close everything out. So we're really looking forward to talking to uh, Dr. Beeler today. That's very kind of you. I wanted to begin by uh, giving a shout out to my good friend, Dave Kelly. Uh, the last time I was on, we got a question at the very end of the show about Admiral Halsey. Uh, and it was actually a reference to a 1971 Paul McCartney song, Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey. <laughs> Uh, and he, he was trying to get me to, to I, I don't know, I was in scholarly mode or something, and I wasn't thinking about pop music reference, and I don't think it's a particularly good song to begin with, uh, which I, I hadn't quite erased it from my memory banks, but I'd come fairly close to doing so. So uh, apologies to Dave Kelly for not catching the, uh, the Paul McCartney reference in there. Um, okay, fire away. Sorry, Rebecca, you're, uh, you're still muted. You know, after all these all these live streams, you think I would uh, get that down, uh, but sometimes it trips, <laughs> trips me up. Um, uh, but how, how should uh, we get started with our conversation with Dr. Beeler today? Uh, uh, yeah, you know, go ahead. Uh, uh, Brandon uh, gave me some questions uh, yesterday, and I've had a chance to scan them over and think about them a little bit, although there's no guarantee that I've had enough coffee that I'll be able to answer them coherently. I'll give it a shot. Uh, this sounds great. Yeah, I think we're all, uh, yeah. This... It's, it's apparently one of those mornings, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, something we were, one of those mornings. Yeah, something we were thinking of doing uh, to continue to engage with people uh, on at least social media, at least online, uh, during this fall semester was to have like a, a museum coffee hour where we all just kind of get on board and we all share what kind of coffee we're drinking and we just talk shop for an hour. And have anybody who's listening kind of join in too. So I think this is a I, good. I don't know what good, kind of is. I only know it has caffeine in it. It's mine is dark. The prime criterion. That's virtually the sole criterion. <laughs> uh, but I, I think we consider this a good trial run for that. Yeah, I was about to say. Let me let me get my. Uh, there we go. Let me figure out how Duncan. my camera works. I'm gonna say um, this morning I'm sponsored um, unofficially by Duncan. Um, because mm. it keeps America running and this morning it keeps me running. But um, can we all get a virtual little like clinky cheers with all of our coffee Absolutely. cups? Because I just really want to try that. Cheers. Cheers. Let me get my, uh, my camera. Cheers. I think I spilled some on my computer key. Uh, if it fritzes if it fritzes out halfway through, we'll know why. Coffee. Always coffee. coffee. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, once again, you know, we're going to follow our similar formula. Uh, we, uh, Catherine and I came up with a list of questions for Dr. Dr. Beeler. We'll touch on as many of them as we can. Uh, if we go off topic, that's great too. I really encourage that. Uh, we're just going to be kind of laid back. All right, Dr. Beeler, if you're ready, uh, we can get started. Sure. All right, so question number one. So what is the role of historic spaces in your work? And kind of a follow-up to that question is how do we get people to start changing the meaning that they give these spaces? Um, I guess I would say that I have paid much more attention to historical spaces since Sharony. My wife, Dr. Sharony Green, has been working on that. She, her current project or she, actually, she's got a manuscript for it now, looks at the way that uh, uh, people of African descent move across spaces in South Florida. Um, my research involves, first of all, a largely homosocial atmosphere. Shipboard life is restricted to, or supposed to be restricted to men uh, in, the, in the 18th and 19th century. There invariably are women on board. Um, but that's another story. 
Uh, and the spaces they're traversing are largely empty spaces, oceans. Um, that said, there's an immense shoreside infrastructure to keep, you know, a first class Navy working. And by the 18th century, the, the Royal Navy dockyards, particularly at Portsmouth and Plymouth, were the largest industrial establishments in Great Britain. This in the pre-industrial revolution era, uh, they are employing, I mean, Portsmouth employs 3,000 men. It's a huge aggregation. And they're not just working on wooden ships. They're founding brass. They're running sawmills. You know, they, you know it's, a, it's a multifaceted industrial operation. Um, and it used to be that we paid very little attention to these spaces. Uh, naval history for an awful long time, like military history, was only really interested in operations. Uh, bugles, brass buttons, bayonets, and famous leaders. Uh, but in the last half century, naval history, military history, both of them have broadened markedly. And we're interested in one administration and log logistics, which is what I do, which is, I must say, for most people, an ex extraordinary subject. And we're also deeply engaged in social history. We want to know more about the men who worked in those dockyard spaces. We want to know more about the men on the lower deck of the Royal Naval vessels, which traversed from Portsmouth to Halifax or to Bermuda or to Jamaica or to Singapore or to Hong Kong. Um, and getting at those stories and the way these men moved across space is a difficult one. It's a challenging one, not as challenging as much of Sharony's research, which deals with voices, well, which deals with people who basically were forbidden to read and write and therefore had a great difficulty leading, leaving any historical trace of themselves. Uh, but many of the men of the lower deck, uh, while they were largely literate, left no written records behind them at all. Maybe a last will and testament. Maybe they appear on a census form. Uh, and so any one of the ones that we deal with, anyone who left a memoir is almost by definition abnormal, exceptional. And therefore we have the problem of, is this a reliable historical record to get at the experiences of these men as they were cooped up in a single sex environment and as they spent months, well, weeks, sometimes months at sea eating plenty of, you know, the caloric in intake didn't suffer, but it wasn't very good food. You know, eating bad food and too much of it, I guess, would be a good way of putting it. And so I'm interested in those spaces. The current project, um, the one about Alexander Milne and his wife, Euphemia, or Effie Cochran Milne, I'm interested in a different set of spaces entirely. Um, I'm interested in how they and their family established themselves as landed gentry in Scotland. I'm interested in the space in which he lived. I'm interested in the space in which his brother and his brother's family lived. His brother and his brother's family had multiple magnificent estates uh, along the Anglo-Scottish border in, in Berwickshire. Uh, Paxton House. In fact, if you want to Google Paxton, P-A-X-T-O-N House, it's open to the public. It's filled with paintings. The portrait gallery, the painting, the uh, the uh, gallery is filled with paintings from the um, the National Gallery of Scotland. You know, it's it, it, you know, the, it just this is immense country. Yeah, there it is. And <laughs> oh, that's lovely. And there's yeah. the river. And there's the River Tweed in the background of it. Uh, yeah. And, it, you know, it is a Palladian mid-18th century house built by one of the most famous, I forget whether it was Rod Robert Adam or William Adam or John Adam. This is family of Scottish architects. But there's, there's the main hall with the gallery. You know where the money for that came from? Slave plantations in Grenada. 
Mm -hmm. uh, sugar grown yeah. in Grenada. It was a guy named Ninian, N-I-N-I-N-I-N-I-A-N, Hume, H-O-M-E, but pronounced Hume, as in David Hume. And he had this immense palatial estate very simple on the exterior, very unadorned, very almost austere, very opulent on the inside, and the money which built that estate, built that mansion, came from on the backs of Africans imported to the Caribbean to grow sugar, and in many cases, simply worked to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for pulling that up. It's open if if you're ever in Scotland, it's well worth a visit. But don't forget the source of the wealth which built it, and don't forget that the people who worked on that estate were, for all intents and purposes, they worked for wage labor, but it was all intents and purposes a quasi feudal society. Um, when uh, the descendant of David Milne Hume, a daughter, got married in the 1930s. Uh, her and her husband came back to this estate. They'd had this jaunt around the world. And when they got to the gates of the estate, the motor to the vehicle was turned off. Ropes were attached to it. And the people who farmed on the estate pulled the vehicle up to the front door as an indication of homage, as an indication of deference, as an indication of their subordinate status. This is all part of this history. This is all part of this space. And you see this magnificent space on the outside. It's well worth visiting again, but never forget the source of the wealth that built it and never forget the quasi feudal relationship that the people who lived in it had with their servants both inside and outside the house. Yeah, the themes you're, you're touching on are, are, have really been explored in academia, I would say for like maybe the last decade where you had this reorientation of your perspective looking at this great person history or the elites, if I'm gonna use an archeological analysis, where you're moving mm -hmm. away from the great person of history and doing a reorientation and really fine tuning your perspective onto the common person, which I don't like that terminology well, I mean, itself either. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. You know, I mean, in, we say, oh, why should we do this? And there are a lot of people uh, who would say, oh, we need, to, we need to focus on the great people, the founding fathers and all that. Well, most of our ancestors weren't the great people. They weren't the founding fathers. They were the common, they were the common people. You know, and by studying ordinary people, we're studying our own ancestors. We're studying where we came from, and we can get to this later on. But you know, the, the, this this raises broader questions, philosophical questions of why study history. But I'll save that for a little bit later. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Um, but yeah, what I would say is like you know we we've been talking about this in academia for about a decade or so. But I think we've seen in the recent really recent times that even. Uh, society at large or public communities are really starting to re-examine our histories and our historic spaces and really doing some soul searching, uh, not only yeah, for here yeah, in the States, know, but also internationally. And I imagine that the guided tour that you give at the Gorgas House is very different in terms of its emphasis from what was given when I started at the university 25 years ago, when it was still probably all bound up in laws cost mythology. I hope We've escaped that. Uh, I note that Rebecca said we have some questions in the comments whenever you feel like it's a good time to get to them. Uh, and maybe we should, I, maybe I should stop gabbing about this and try and gab about something else. No, this is fun and educational and we can do this for an hour. That's fine with me. But uh, yeah, let's, let's bring up a, a viewer comment. So Stephen Polanski asks, it's the US Coast Guard's birthday. Uh, does England have an equivalent? Yes, Steve, it does, but it functioned, it, one, it functioned largely initially as an agency to tr try to prevent smuggling, which was rife 
the whole East Coast and particularly the Southeast Coast of Britain. All you needed was an obscure cove or inlet and you could sneak French brandy and French lace gloves across the channel at night um, in return for the manufactured goods that England produced or Britain produced more cheaply than anywhere else. And so that was the original origin of the Coast Guard. It wasn't really about saving lives. It was trying to make sure that Her Majesty's or His Majesty's revenue got the money that was due to them. In the early 19th century, they tried to sort of multi or dual purpose the Coast Guard as a reserve of seamen for the Royal Navy uh, because they were beginning to realize the growth of humanitarianism, you can't practice impressment anymore. It might still be legal on the books, but it is a form of kidnapping. And with the growth of humanitarianism, we see this in the abolition of the slave trade and the abolition of slavery uh, in many of Great Britain's possessions in the 1830s, you can't treat deep water sailors like slaves, which is essentially what you're, well, okay, you're, they're pay, you're paying them, so they're not technically slaves, but you can't force them to be on sh Royal Navy ships against their will. And so they see the Coast Guard as a sort of, oh, this is a reserve of seamen. You know, we can get several thousand guys into this. And if war comes along, you know, we can just transfer them into the Royal Navy and, you know, well, it didn't work very well. War did come along. The Crimean War came along in 1854, and it was discovered that were, there were only about 2,000 men in the Coast Guard. Uh, many of them were what the English call superannuated. They were too old to serve as deep sea sailors, and a great many of them had never been to sea in their life. Um, so, so much for the Coast Guard. After the Crimean War, actually, it is transferred from Treasury control to to Admiralty, to Navy Department control. Um, but it continues largely to be this agency which is concerned with preventing smuggling. Uh, and it's not really all that successful at it, Steve. I, I hope that answers your question. All right, so John, I want to reference back to something you mentioned pretty early on in our first question, and I, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up. So you did mention that there were women sailors during the 19th century. Are there any notable figures or any interesting stories or histories about women in, uh, on ships? Again, again, we're, 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 we're faced with the same problem we have with men, enlisted personnel, lower deck personnel, uh, in that they leave few traces of themselves in the written record on which history is based. Uh, at the top level, the Admiralty, the, the British Navy Department, tries its darndest to keep women, and I might add children, off, uh, you know, off ships. But in the latter years of the Royal Navy, or the, the Royal, the, in the latter years of the Napoleonic Wars, let me get my words in order here. Uh, a guy named Sir David Milne, who happens to be the father of Alexander Milne and the father of David Milne, who owned Paxton House, who inherited Paxton House, or I should say his wife inherited Paxton House, and such was the nature of uh, Victorian law that it, is, for all intents and purposes, became his property rather than hers. Let's hear it for patriarchy. Uh, I'm being sarcastic here. Uh, but Sir David Milne, 1811, is conducting a blockade off the coast of France, and a fellow Royal Navy captain comes on board and discovers that Sir David Milne has not only his wife on board, but also his two children. This is 1811, and they were born in 1805 and 1806, respectively. Alexander's the younger one, David's the older one, so they're six and five years old. And the captain who discovers this says, basically, don't you know this is against admiralty regulations? And, and Milne says, essentially, well, let them find out. You know? <laughs> Until then, they're going to live with me. Uh, but also, if you go to the lower deck, um, invariably, we find women on board who do the traditional tasks assigned to women. Uh, they are in charge of law. The cook do so, though I should add that such is the nature of, of lower deck life that the men on board know how to do all of these things as well, because they have to. They have to be self-sufficient. They are usually the wives of senior petty officers. 
They are usually the wives of gunners or gunners' mates or bosons or bosons' mates or sailmakers or sailmakers' mates. And they're invariably a handful of women on board. And the authorities on shipboard turn a blind eye to this. And the Admiralty, which officially prohibits it, as far as I know, makes no attempt to actually enforce their prohibition. We don't know their names. We don't know a whole lot about them. We do know they were there. Whenever a vessel has been at sea and comes into a port city, it is immediately surrounded by boats coming out from the harbor, offering items for sale, offering local produce for sale, offering local spirits for sale, and there are sex workers as well. And they come on board and the scenes of current, you know, 19th century, the scenes of debauchery below decks are, quote, not to be believed, end quote. This is invariable. If you cook, if you cook several dozen or several hundred men up in a single sex environment for a period of days or weeks or months, this is the more or less inevitable consequence of what you've done to them when they arrive in a port city where there are women. I think there are a lot of more, a lot of songs that are yeah. uh, there are a lot of songs that um, <laughs> come out of come out of that um, right that right that mentality. Uh, Brandy um, from the and I, I I don't know I know so many oldie songs but I'm terrible about yeah it, like, was, a gr- it was a group called um, it was a group called Steam. Believe me, <clears throat> this, this is what <laughs> no. I get for having grown up during that era. And we always think, oh, that was the golden age of rock and roll. And, and you got to remember the Osmond brothers were at the top of the charts at the same time that Uncle Albert has Will Halsey, which was not that great a song to begin with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll <laughs> shut up now. <clears throat> But um, but the there there are a handful of things, John, that you've mentioned that uh, that have sparked um, certain remembrances in 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 my mind of things that I've seen and you know whatnot. And again, that that could be a completely completely different conversation. But um, but we do we uh, or a whole nother hours worth of conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. But we do uh, we do have a question that um, that has come in. Um, this one is from uh, Ronald Howard. Ron, it's good to see you. You've tuned in a couple of times, so welcome back. We appreciate it. And uh, Ron's question is regarding women on British ships. Any comment on the origin of the term "son of a gun"? You know, I don't know, and I it sounds. I have heard it as an American colloquialism. I don't recall ever. Rec- Call having heard it as a British colloquialism. I've logged a fair amount of time in Britain. What we might do <clears throat> is check the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a handy dandy uh, reference tool available to anybody who has access to the databases at Gorgas Library, and see if that colloquialism is lift- listed in the OED. Because the OED, and I think some other dictionaries as well, but it's the one I'm most familiar with, also lists the etymology of this world, this colloquialism. As far as we know, when it was first used, where it was first used, and by whom it was first used. And in fact, I was looking at it the other day. Because Alexander Milne, as befit a gentleman in London in the early in the late 1840s, bought himself a horse. Uh, but being a th- thrifty Scotsman, here's a stereotype for you: he didn't want to pay too much for the horse, and he bought one that had 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 gout. Uh, and he said, I took him out for his morning ride. I had these letters, uh, uh, and it, he was all he was fine. But I shall no doubt find a screw loose, and it got me thinking. That's an industrial eye. That's the term of the industrial era, isn't it? Right. When was it first used? OED, 1810. The first time this particular colloquial, as far as we know, the first time this particular colloquialism was used in 1810. So indeed, it was a product of the industrial era where screws became widely available as a fastening means of fastening. It was used by Charles Dickens in Martin Chuzzlewit in 1843. So I know all of this stuff. And this is a long way of saying, I haven't a clue about the origins of the words or the phrase son of a gun. 
I think it's American. I'm not sure of that. I would start by looking in the OED. Well, fantastic. All right, John, I'm going to okay, well, shift away a little bit. That's a long and convoluted non-answer. Uh, I liked it. I'll take it. I know. Um, I was say any reference to the the Oxford English Dictionary, and my ears immediately perk up. So yeah, that, we can, yeah. Oh, it, oh, it's a wonderful resource. Absolutely wonderful resource. Okay, so I'm going to reference back, um, kind of given the questions we established earlier. So you were instrumental in creating and working with Dr. Sherry Green, who we mentioned, uh, on the Space Matters exhibit installed the Gorgas House last year, where uh, Dr. Green was reinterpreting and reimagining space and what they actually mean to individual people. Um, so do you often get a chance to create these types of physical installations and art pieces? Uh, and if you do, what are some of the others that you've worked on? I, I would first start by first and say first saying I'm not the creative one. I'm not the creator of this. Sharon is the creator of this. Uh, I'm fond of saying if I was a creative person, I would be a novelist because I could just make this stuff up and it would be much easier than writing history where you actually have to go and do research. But I'm not a creative person and I need the historical record to provide me with the foundations for the story that I'm attempting to tell. So how we work, I, I, I like to think it's, it's, it's a fine collaborative effort, but she basically says, this is what I would like to do, and I'm the facilitator. I'm the one who translates the idea into a physical entity, into a, uh, a museum, exhibition um and you know so my role i've always regarded my role as largely technical um you know rather than creative you know i'm i'm i i i'm the stagehand type person rather than the direct director of journey and prior to our joining you know, joining, living our lives together, I never did anything of that sort, at least not that I can remember. Um, uh, and so, you know, I have creativity, I guess, but it expresses itself in other avenues. And I don't think in this big scale uh, uh, museum exhibition, Sharon is also an artist. So she has an artist conception of things, which I simply don't have. You know, John, you, you could enter into a whole new world. Basically, what you just described is historic fiction. You've got you've got the history and yeah. the fiction part comes in where you use a little bit of creativity to kind of fill in the gaps as you tell the story. So the bulk of it right. is based on, you know, historic, um, you know, historic fact and knowledge as we know it. But then there's also that just little bit of creativity that just kind of fills in the gaps. I mean, if Philippa Gregory can do it, I'm positive you can do it. <laughs> well, but the historian would say, make clear to the readers that in filling in the gaps, I'm ranging into the realm of speculation, whereas the writer of historical fiction would imagine conversations and probably not make a point of telling the reader, oh, by the way, I'm making up this conversation. Uh, but you know, no, I mean, good historical fiction, and I love good historical fiction, and it's not just Horatio Hornblower and nautical fiction. Uh, I, you know, I mean, Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, French Revolution. Yeah, I mean, this is great historical fiction. Um, uh, I love that, but you know, I was trained as a historian, and so I have to do chapter and verse with my sources so that anybody who's trying to follow the paper trail can pin down exactly, you know, I've, I'm fortunate because I've got all of these letters of Alexander Milne to his stepmom and to his wife. And when he says the beast has a screw loose and he's a strange reference for a horse to have a screw loose after all, um, you know, I'm not making this up. He actually wrote this, you know, and so I've got, Unlike Sharony, who's working with voices, which who for historically have not only been silenced, but who were in fact forbidden to read and write, I've got this treasure trove of words 
uh, and it becomes an embarrassment of riches. I want to get everything in there, you know, and I'm turning into an antiquarian while I do this, um, you know, rather than a real historian, because I'm not really doing any analyzing. Do you, do you find that kind of hard? Like whenever, you know, you've got, you've got someone as um, prolific as Admiral Milne, who has all of these records and, you know, things written, um, you know, to him and then things that he has written, you know, do you find it harder to, you know, disseminate any unknown historical information when you have so much to, to go off of, or does it make it a little bit easier? It's harder. Uh, it's mm-hmm. harder for a variety of reasons. And the first one, I may have mentioned this in our last conversation. The first one was, you know, I started doing top down dead white male political, administrative, and logistical history. And Milne's professional papers are a treasure trove for that. Um, in fact, such a treasure trove that I've been engaged in in editing them for public some of them for publication selected ones for publication and this this project has already run to half a million words over half a million words with two volumes yet to be published but there's an equally large treasure trove of private and personal papers the letters to his stepmom the letters to his brother the letters to his fiance and then wife um and they shed light not only on the relationships the personal relationships between these individuals but by extrapolation they share a lot of light on questions about intimacy amongst the victorians because letter writing is a more intimate form of communication in many respects than talking because there are always servants present when you're talking and they might just gossip about what you said whereas a letter particularly if it's marked private or confidential and you tuck it in your pocket after you've read it so the servants won't see it left on this table or you know this they can write um and so letter writing allows greater displays of intimacy at the same time we need to keep in mind that letter writing is a performance and you always write what you write with the the thought in your mind of how this is going to be received by the person who's doing the reading and you choose your words accordingly so there's a performative aspect to letter writing which means that letters have to be used with caution they can allow us greater insight but at the same time You can argue no document, not even a diary, is intended to be completely private. You're always writing it with an idea in the back of your mind that somebody else is going to be reading it. Um, Moreover, and here I am blabbing on, I'm in the midst of dealing with Milne and his stepmom's decision to redecorate the estate that he lives in, in Musselboro, Scotland. Well, she lives in it. He's in London because he's employed by the Admiralty in London. And he's the one who's paying the money. And what sorts of wallpaper they should use. I just got to a a phrase and I will go ahead and read this off. Um, uh, Hang on. Let me find this, find the right one. Oh, um, in late January 1849, he shared the price of plate glass with Agnes, his stepmom, and the following months asked her for the size of the windows because, quote, I can get plate glass very cheap and beautifully figured translucent glass for one shilling a foot, and the most beautiful flower patterns in colored glass for six shillings a foot. And let me get back online so I can see it. You couldn't have done that 50 years earlier. This is the industrialization of glassmaking. It's going to come bigger still as they figure out how you can make means to do it rather than having glass originally hand blown. But this is about, Marx would say, this is about commodity fetishism. 
this is about i can afford to wallpaper the house i want something that looks genteel but he is a scotsman i don't want it to be too expensive and there's a very interesting dynamic between he and his stepmother about making the choice of selections of things like wallpaper you know, I've got a better selection available to me in London. So I visited this huge shop on Oxford Sheet Street, which has the greatest selection I've ever seen. And I'm sending you some samples. I put checks on the ones which I think would be appropriate here for X, Y, or Z room. But there are other rooms in the house and you make the decision. You know, I'll trust to you to make the decision. And so there's a dynamic here. The interior of a house according to Victorian separate spheres ideology is basically the woman's face. But the man is paying the money to do this. And therefore the man has some input on, you know, the, cho the choice of wallpaper. But at the same time, the woman has a good deal of autonomy. And so this is a story about male female relationships in the Victorian era which to some extent goes against the grain of what we think about the man always being the boss. Okay, that requires mastering a new secondary literature, though, because I don't know anything about the secondary literature, about commodification, about, you know, buying patterns of wallpaper on Oxford Street and sharing them with your stepmom uh, 300 miles away. Uh, uh, um, and making some decisions and leaving other decisions to her and buying glass in London because it's a lot cheaper than buying it in Edinburgh or Leith and you've got a better selection and yada, yada, yada. And so there's a tale to be told here. And I think it's a more interesting tale than just an administrative history. But by the same token, it requires me sort of learning a secondary literature which i haven't made use of i want to be a social and cultural historian obviously i don't want to do dead white male history anymore i don't want to do top-down political history any an old dog of whom we think we can't teach new tricks so i'm going to have try and halfway learn a new trick here and, and so that, that's a that's a long and roundabout way of answering a question that i probably haven't even answered no, I think I, I think that's that's very that's all very interesting, and it all it all really makes sense that you but, know. Um, but, I mean, I I've got too much information. I've got too many avenues that I can pursue, which gets back to your original question. You know, it was a bad enough problem with the professional papers because historians have to decide where the level of the line of significance is drawn, whether something is significant enough to be included in the story and therefore above the line or whether it's trivial enough that it doesn't wor warrant mention in the story maybe in a footnote but maybe not even there and it's below the line of significance and by editing Milne's professional papers I've lost all track of where that line of significance is supposed to be I've turned into an antiquarian it's all important, he it's said. It's all important. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so many things that you've said have just, you know, again, have have triggered my my coffee's working because there are synapses firing in my brains of of like, you know, first one first one movie reference and another to you know throughout yeah, our yeah, entire if don't, conversation. If we don't take notes, we forget them all, and you can thank Dunkin' Donuts for those synapses firing as well. <laughs> I'm I'm really appreciative of this morning. You you really have no idea, um, but there there are there are so many so many things that you said that have have triggered little you know thoughts in in my own mind where I'm like oh yeah they've made a reference to such and such on this show that I watched or this movie or you know whatever mm -hmm. and you know, I love and, that and you pointed out that you know you've been studying Mill's professional papers but you haven't really had the chance to study. Um, you know, commodity history for this same period, which would, you know, give an entirely different perspective. And I love that that's been, I, I just love that that's been verbalized because it just kind of shows, I think that, you know, history is not a straight line, like we've all been taught it is, and that it really mm -hmm. is this incredibly tangled and convoluted web that depending on what 
string of that web you choose to follow would take you in a completely different path. And um, but whenever they all work together, you try to get a more holistic view of what life and whatever capacity that was looks like at a particular moment in time. And I think that is an amazing, um, amazing point to make. Um, about history in general. And so I'm really glad, I'm really glad that you've, you've kind of gone down that little rabbit hole because it's so there are a lot relevant. Of them. It's so <laughs> relevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I agree with, with you, but you know, it's, it's a delicate line between getting the detail in there, which is necessary if we are going to try and come up with a representative depiction of the past to try and see the world through the eyes of the people who were living in the 1840s and 1850s rather than through, through the eyes of our our own period our early 20th century first century view but by the same token the historical record is messy the historical record is complicated and we have to convey that messiness and complication to readers or we're not doing our jobs right, but here and here's the real problem. The more messiness and complexity we get into our story, the fewer readers we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And so you need to make it accessible. History is not or should not be written in jargon, which can only be read by adepts, as many social sciences are, as much literary criticism is. Uh, it should be accessible to the general reader, but by trying to simplify your story to make it accessible, you run the serious risk of obscuring the complications and the messiness. That is good a similar. Can, yeah. Good historians can do both, you know, and we should constantly strive to do both. Yeah, that is a similar problem when you're interpreting historic spaces like the Gorgas or the Transportation Museum. We have, you know, we are moving away from this romanticized early mid 20th century interpretation of the site and how it's been presented for the last 70, 80 years and really exploring these other histories that have just as much meaning, if not more, to the space. And how do you compartmentalize that and disseminate that so that the person walking off the street can I don't know, retain it and take it away with them. Right. right. It, it's it's yeah, it's a conversation I have all the time for people who are willing to have more time and more uh, emotional investment, mental investment in our tours. We can actually give them more of those complexities, and they can take right. away more. But like you said, it, it is an issue. Like, how do you package these things into tiny little parcels based on who you're talking to, what their interests are, and what they're coming to hear? Uh, because as you referenced several times now. Whoever writes the history is writing it for a purpose, is writing for someone, and is writing it for a certain interpretation. And you know, as we as historians and museum specialists and anthropologists are really trying to parcel all of this out and really bring out who the individual people are we're trying to talk about. And it's an incredibly, it can be incredibly difficult, but it's incredibly reward, rewarding too, because you actually get to the human agency, the things that we're trying yeah. to read about. Yeah, yeah. agreed, yeah. agreed. Yeah. I love I what I'm one doing. Of the, one of the hardest, <laughs> one of the hardest things that I find is whenever we're working on an exhibit, you know, here at the Transportation Museum, is how do we make this information digestible to the general public? You know, so that um, you know, again, visitors come in and they enjoy their experience, but whenever they leave, they leave knowing at least one thing that they didn't know whenever they walked in, or they thought it was one way they've seen the exhibit and now understand that it is actually different, you know, something yeah. like that, but making yeah. all of that digestible. Um, or there's is, a side of the story a, that they never chat. thought about. Or, or yeah. exactly. Or there's a side of the story that they, they didn't, you know, that they didn't know about exactly like making all of that digestible is, um, is a challenge in and of itself. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's just like Brandon said, you know, it's something that we, that we, we work with, um, you know, we work with constantly and I don't, I don't think anybody, um, anybody has cracked the, cracked the code to make it easy to do. And I, I don't know if that code can ever be no, it cracked. So. No, it won't be, but that shouldn't stop us from trying. 
Oh, absolutely. We're all going to keep trying to do it. Right. <laughs> It'll take a lot more coffee, though, I think. <laughs> I, I, I just ran out of mine, so I got to think if I'm going to make another, get another cup or not. I know. Okay. I'm, I'm out myself. <laughs> all right. So we're about 45 minutes into this. Not down to the dregs. Yeah, it's, we're it's nice and empty. We're, we're in the all right. We're caffeinated. Right, so, we'll be okay for another 15 minutes. All right. So we're, we're basically in the seventh inning. We're in the last quarter. Uh, and there's a couple of questions that I actually have to get to. Otherwise, I'd be remiss if I didn't. So tell us about your music collection and how you use it in your teaching. Because I've heard a thing or two from uh, Dr. Green at this point, and I want to get your perspective and your take on it. So yeah, tell us about it, uh, how to use it in your teaching, because it sounds like it's a lot of fun. It is, it is a lot of fun, although I, I should preface this by saying I'm in uh, – in terms of my training, I'm by no means qualified to use it in my teaching at all. I'm not a musicologist. Uh, I'm, I'm not a student of late 20th century British popular culture. Uh, I didn't. I didn't train as that uh, as a historian. But I, like many kids, I was enamored of you know the music I heard on the radio in the late 60s and very early 70s. And this was a, this was an era when AM radio was still dominant, and AM Top 40 played virtually everything. It wasn't just the quote classic rock bands. It was Stax. It was Motown. It was Muscle Shoals. There was some country and western thrown in. Johnny Cash's. <clears throat> Well, it was Gatlinburg in mid-July, and I just hit town. My throat was dry. A uh, boy named Sue, and it was there. There were there was, there was the Osmond brothers were thrown in there, and Sergeant Barry Sadler and the Ballad and Berets got thrown in there as well. But you heard virtually every a, a great deal of what was worth listening, and a good deal of what wasn't worth listening to. And I started collecting records and. And, you know, I can date the point at which I turned serious at this. It was 1971. I was 15 years old. And the record collection has just grown and grown and grown. And it grow, grew immensely in the 80s and 90s because other people were ditching their record collections in favor of CDs and, you know, these big bulky records. You put them out for a yard sale. Nobody's going to buy the damn things. Or pardon my language because it's an obsolete technology. So they get hauled off to the Salvation Army and I frequent the Salvation Army and I buy these things. And I, you know, end up with multiple copies of really great albums and things like that. And Sharon e has probably told you uh, and perhaps censoriously, uh, that I have an entire garage full of records now, which is true. I absolutely do have an entire garage full of records. And, you know, other than making pop culture references in my teaching and back in the 80s and 90s, I could make pop culture references to the 70s. And my students would still get them. And you could say Jethro Tull, uh, and the inventor of the seed drill, which he was, uh, and the kids would say, oh, that's, you know, that's, you know, that that's a pop culture reference. But if I try and make that one now, maybe one or two class kids in the class, and they are kids to me now, they're young enough to be my grand grandchildren would get it. But back in, to finish the question, very answering the question very fast, back in 2007, I was participating in the Alabama to Oxford program, and the Alabama to Oxford program is driven entirely by student fees. Uh, you know, the professor's salaries go out, come out of what the students pay, yada, 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 all of that. So you've got to come up with a course which is tr attractive to students. And I thought, hey, I can make use of this incredible, you know, record collection. I can make use of my knowledge, which I've accumulated over the years, and I'll teach a class on British pop music and culture. Never mind the fact that I'm completely, completely incompetent when it comes to teaching something like that from a historical or mu musicological standpoint. Nobody can tell me no. I've got tenure. I'm a full professor. And nobody can tell me no. You know, and that, and that's, <laughs> and, and you know and i'm making light of it but that's basically the way that it came about and i started i first i started teaching on the alabama and oxford program uh but then uh the university of alabama increasing enrollments once students 
posteriors and seats, to use the polite term. And so we are enjoined, entreated, cajoled to offer classes which are going to fill the full subscription and British pop music and culture, British pop culture and music invariably does. And it's branched out from there. A few years ago, uh, I curated an exhibition of album covers of African-American artists for Black History Month, which is on display uh, in Ferguson for February. This would have been February 2015. Uh, and so, you know, pick 50 covers of landmark albums by landmark artists by the Miles Davises and Robert Johnson's and James Brown's of this world and provide a curated statement of what the album itself signifies and why the artist is, was, is, was important. And so, yeah, I, I, I use that collection a lot in ways that I'd never envisioned. I lend albums to my friends downstairs. Uh, Eric Weisbard published a book recently called Top 40 Demo uh, Democracy. And I think the pictures of the Isley Brothers albums in that book are credited to me because he borrowed them to take photographs of them. And so I can help creative people like Sharon and Eric and not be a creative person myself. <laughs> Just be a facilitator. That's that's fantastic. I and I, I think I knew I was in the right place in one of the first anthropology classes I took with Dr. Jim Benden because he was playing. Benden is um, wonderful. He was playing. I wish uh, I could Pink throw a Floyd. ponytail like him too. <laughs> Uh, well, he came in, and as he was getting so settled, he started playing music, and he was playing Pink Floyd's Hole in the Wall, and I thought, I have found my people. This is fantastic. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm, I'm always I'm always a fan of, of utilizing music. And speaking of Alabama and Oxford, I didn't do that program, but my sister did. So I'm actually uh, quasi-familiar with, with, uh, with that program. But mm -hmm. um, there are just a couple of questions that we want to get to in these last few minutes. Um, but I just want to ask... Uh, what is a what is your favorite historic place that you have visited and why? And then are there any, you know, what historic places would you like to visit but haven't gotten to yet? Narrowing down the historic place I'm most that I visited that I like the most is is a tough one. I've been to the historic dockyards. I've been to Chatham and Portsmouth and Plymouth. Uh, and those fire my interest in how you create the industrial shoreside logistical infrastructural basis for maintaining the greatest Navy in the world. But by the same token, Paxton House is just this incredible place as well. Um, you know, never losing sight of the fact what some of the stories behind Paxton House. Um, and every time I'm in a historic museum or archive, the old reading room at the National Maritime Museum in the Carib Library, which is just this wonderful, stately, paneled walnut walls and big mahogany tables. It just this in sense of, it, it wasn't all that old. I mean, it's late 19th and early 20th century, but it was built to look a lot older than that. You know, it was built classical, you know, 18th century style um, or neoclassical 18th century style. But there, there is this sense of feeling like you're in a historic place. I imagine you get this a lot at the Gorgas House, Brandon. Uh, and, you know, the Queen City bathhouse and the Queen City, you know, swimming pool has its own history, not all uplifting either. Um, uh, there are a whole bunch of places that I would like to visit that I've never actually visited. And I'll start at the top of the list. Alexander's Milne's home in Musselboro, Inveresk House, not a grand estate of the sort that his brother had at Paxton House, but a fairly significant mansion house on a few acres in Elvis community, you know, let's hear it for regentrification. Uh, and 
yeah, I've been there, and yeah, I've been to the churchyard that he's buried, and there's this immense uh, tombstone. You can look it up on Wikipedia under his name or his father's name, but I've never seen the house. I've never seen, I can see the back of it through the gates. I've never mm -hmm. seen really the front of the house, and I've never since set up the flats. It probably bears very little resemblance to what it looked like in the mid 19th or the late 19th century. Uh, I bet his billiard room isn't his billiard room anymore. Uh, but I would, you know, I I guess that's at the top of the list of places I I'd, I'd like to see. But you know, here's here's a telling admission or embarrassing admission from a British historian. I've been to Britain. I couldn't tell you how many times. I've never been to Ireland. I've never oh. been to Dublin. Talk about a place with a lot of history. I've never been to Belfast. Talk about a place with a lot of history. And again, a lot of it mm, rather less than pleasant. Uh, but, you know, there. I've never been to Bermuda. I've never been to Halifax. I've never been to Jamaica. I've never been to these Royal Navy outposts. Uh, from which global power, naval power, was projected in the 19th century, and Alexander Milne played a large role in this. Yeah, yeah. So again, a long-winded, but I hope uh, enlightening reply. Have you um, have you um, had the opportunity, had the opportunity to, be, to be? Well, I mean, before, well, I mean, it, before it was before. before it was damaged. Unfortunately, um, did you have a chance to tour the Cuddy Sark? In, uh, in oh yeah, Ireland. absolutely. Long before the fire, I think yeah. actually, my mom was born and raised in in southeastern England in Kent, and and so the family visited periodically while while my parents were alive, and I know we visited the Cuddy Sark back in the 1970s. I think probably 1974. It's been years ago, but I used to walk by it every day on the way to the National Maritime Museum because it's halfway between the tube stop or the train station and the uh, and the National Maritime Museum itself. And that was before but that was before the fire yeah. and since the fire, too, for that matter. Yeah. We've got um, I think we've got we've got one quick question. Um, Ron asks, um, have you ever been on the HMS Victory and uh, any any comment on it? And this will probably be the last question before I, I have a special request. As we <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The last time go. I was on the HMS Victory <coughs> was for a meal for a conference I was attending in Portsmouth. This would have been a few a few years ago. They rent that space out for fo social functions. You can get married on HMS Victory if you want to. You can have pay for a meal on board HMS Victory. Um, by and large, I think it's been restored fairly close to its actual appearance at in the early 19th century at the Battle of Trafalgar, although the last time I was there, they were completely redoing the masts and rigging because this stuff is made of wood and rope and with exposure to the elements, it eventually rots and you need to replace it. Um, yeah, I've been to the, the, the Victory several times. My favorite historic ship at Portsmouth, though, is HMS Warrior, the world's first seagoing ironclad. Um, uh, so there are three historic ships at Portsmouth, all of them were seeing the Mary Rose, which is Henry VIII period. There's part of that. Uh, the Victory, which is late 18th and early 19th century, and HMS Warrior, which was completed in 1861. Iron Hall, another function of industrialization or another product of industrialization. Shut up now. <laughs> no, I'm 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 sad that I'm sad that this uh, this stream is is only intended to be an hour because there are so there are so many things that we could continue to talk about. But um, we do we do need to we do need to get um, we do need to wrap up this this particular episode. And um, we you mentioned or we have discussed uh, because I asked um, off stream if there was any familiar familial relationship between um, Admiral Alexander Milne and and the famous A.A. A. Milne, the author of Winnie the Pooh, which you told me that no, there is not, because Milne, um, unbeknownst to me before this conversation, is a rather common name in Scotland. But yeah. considering this is our last live stream for, uh, you know, for a little while, is there any way I could ask you to uh, sign off for us as your favorite character, Eeyore? 
Oh, yeah, I can do that. Let me say how disappointed I am that we have to draw things to an end here. Because even though I'm in a depressed mood, I could probably keep going on for hours and hours and hours. Ten ten. Not bad. Not bad at all. Oh much. That was fantastic. <laughs> That was great, and thank you for the uh, the great dis discussion that you all had. Uh, I was just uh, going through all the things that uh, Dr. Beeler you were mentioning about places you wanted to go, and I found all this great Ireland drone footage, and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to go to Ireland. Uh, so mm -hmm. thank you, thank you all for the discussion. Uh, that is going to do it for this uh, final museums from uh, your home live stream. Uh, we've we've gotten pretty good at, at live streaming uh, at UA Museum, so I think we'll probably do uh, some of this in the future. So just hang out with us and make sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to the UA Museum's YouTube channel so that you can uh, catch us in the future when we do some of these uh, some of these. Uh, on down the road, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash UA Museums and follow us and subscribe to us there. Uh, if you want to uh, visit uh, some of the uh, the past live streams that we've done uh, throughout this initiative, you can go to museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. You can also see uh, Dr. Beeler's first uh, uh, time to join us. So you can uh, go back and revisit some of those old live streams uh, if you would like. And if you would like to support uh, UA Museums and all the programming that we'll be doing um, in the next year, you can go to give.ua.edu slash museums and become a supporting member. We would love it if you did, uh, would go and consider that. So thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk about that. And I think that's uh, that's going to do it for us. Thank you to, to Catherine and Brandon for uh, being the the sort of the host and the moderator of these discussions that you all have done a really great job. You've become professional live streamers. I'm so proud. Uh, so uh, <laughs> way to go. Um, so thank you uh, to, to you all for being with us and to Dr. Beeler for joining us and sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise with us today. And thank you to everybody who was uh, watching us live and who will watch us in the future and for visiting UA Museums from your home. It's been my pleasure.